So hello again, here we go, uh, Fest 3, uh, presentation 3. Um, always a pleasure to introduce uh, Captain Zaria Irani, um, colleague, friend, immediate past president of the Institute, and uh, Zaria, you've always got something interesting to say. I think when you came up um, with this presentation uh, idea, uh, coming back to a survey report, uh, I'm reminded constantly of the importance of the report and uh, Facts Without Fiction is exactly how I would sum it up. Um, we, on Monday, a couple of days ago, we did uh, a fest for small craft surveyors. And again, we touched on this very same thing. Report writing, it is a bit of an art form, really important to get it right. So Zaria, without further ado, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, welcome to all. Um, Talk about facts without fiction. That's what a report should be, uh, unless otherwise specifically told. But uh, let's identify some of the most common aspects. Uh, I've picked mostly blue water work today. Um, we will uh, we will uh, look at examples. We will look at some very very brief factual statements. But more importantly, let me. Uh, let me open this by saying if you go away with proofreading your reports after you've written them with this presentation in mind i'm sure you will find something to tweak in your language in which you report i all the time find some assumption or some phrase or some way that I have written in my proofreading of my own reports that I would like to put across in a different manner, maybe sounding more factual or just completely remove it because I think it's uh, it's not at all, you know, factual in the report. So um, with 22,500 jobs behind us, I can't say that all of them are done by me, but they have been in my uh, watch, I've overseen those for Constellation Marine. And uh, I think we've come across uh, enough self-correcting mechanism, which we feel we can share with fellow surveyors. Uh, the Institute means a lot to me. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. I have spent considerable amount of time with my mentors, seniors, board members, who all of them have a lot to offer this profession and my own uh, collection of thoughts and uh, uh, what is coming out here is some of the examples that I've studied myself in the IMS diploma that I did years ago. Uh, uh, I've gone through those books, it's there in the bibliography in the end uh, as an acknowledgement, but I would say some of them are aspects from the books with live cases that we've done. Names of the vessels have been kept away, but uh, without much ado, let's get cracking on the agenda as to what you all are gonna get out of this presentation. So I just mentioned examples of facts, examples of assumptions, and uh, there is a couple of slides in the end, which uh, is kind of an advisory note. So if, 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 if you all, don't have the patience or time, at least the last five or 10 minutes of this presentation will be uh, having loads and loads of takeaway as a summary of some of the advisory. There's a lot that we can say about these things, but I've picked and chosen a few things out of our life cases and our experience that I can share with you all with an open uh, mind. Uh, without much ado, the first case that I have, and I always, love this example and it's nothing to do with shipping that's the beauty of this uh, it's to do with our daily lives and um, our daily lives we've all been parents or our parents and have brought up kids in our lives and if you look at a factual statement which which may uh, sound when um, when you tell a story to somebody about some kid falling off would, would be a simple factual statement. It should paint a picture of what happens. Uh, a five-year-old Adam had permanent 
injury, neurological injury when he fell off his neighbor's apple tree upon being left alone at home. That is absolute factual information in this. But this is more or less what you get as nominations as to a notification of what went wrong. But it would be factual, uh, you know. Here are some of the assumptions or opinions on causations that one would immediately come up with. Now, <clears throat> if I was a husband, I would never ever blame my wife to have left Adam alone at home. Uh, but some of them who do not, not, especially grandparents amongst us, would say that Adam should not have been left alone as a toddler. It would be, they would deem it to be parents' negligence. And an opinion, well, even if he was left alone and he was sitting where he was sitting, and the uh, the parent would have come back and found him there. The negligence would have still been there, but there would have not been any injury to Adam. So there's got to be more than that towards uh, the, 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 the cause issue. So that opinion might be straight away wrong. Whoever it is that is saying that oh, the parents shouldn't have left a kid alone. There's another opinion that one may find, uh, uh, especially grumpy neighbors and they would say why would the neighbor leave the backyard open it's because they left the backyard open the 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 kid uh, went in and climbed up the apple tree well he could have climbed up and climbed down without getting injured so that can't be it either but that could that's another opinion that might be so all these if 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 these are found and you know given the fact that um, adam has had a permanent neurological injury in somebody else's property there would be a case there would be litigation there would be somebody claiming some insurance from somebody or maybe a criminal investigation so all these uh, are opinions and i'll run through a, another one uh, the branch may be extended over a, a third neighbor's uh, premises and he might have actually fell on a concrete um, structure laid down uh, well it's substantial but if there was soft mud he would have not got into it then adam didn't have the know-how or the access to the load bearing capacity uh, to assess the load bearing capacity of the branch self-inflicted well that play, plays a part if if it is so proven but again the branch would have broken and would landed on his feet not on his head so that can't be so really speaking if you look at what the insurance companies need, and if this was an insurance claim and there was an insurance survey investigating this, you would have probably come with a factual cause consideration, and it would still be a consideration, it would not be a fact, and you would say simply that the head made contact with the hard surface enough to damage his skull as a result causing him permanent injury. And the injury which could not be cured with known medical expertise available. And you would state examples of treatment probably Adam would have attempted. However, the first part let's focus on. This is what we're saying and this is what most surveys should be sounding like. This is exactly what happened. His head made contact with the concrete and the force was enough to rip his head open and cause him permanent injury or cause an injury to start with. Whether permanent or not, it might be permanent injury now, but maybe 10 years down the line, there might be a cure for it and might not be permanent anymore. So that word permanent there could also be questioned in terms of whether it is a fact or it might be different. But however, <clears throat> you could say that all the above, the four points are there, you could mention them in your report as statements of facts that he was left alone, the neighbor's yard, what a door was open and the neighbors uh, the third neighbors flooring was concrete or hard surface etc etc now this these have to form part of your of your report because it's all considering uh, built up towards the accident 
So here's a little bit of a teaser to just start getting into the groove of what, what we're talking about. Now imagine this is an average everyday fall of a child. It need not have been permanent. It need not have been left alone, but kids keep falling around and keep getting injured. But look at the amount of complexities and assumptions that could have been thought of. And sometimes these find their way in reports of severe if it is a maritime related matter. Now there are ships going out to sea. People put pressure on their ship's crew to kind of hold back information, log books, entries, you know, reasons, this, that. So, you know, it's, it's never ever as straightforward and easy as possible. But if you go with the perspective of saying that every factual is, uh, contribution to the, to the matter will be reported, you will have a better understanding of it. Now let's get to the, to the, to the meat of this presentation. We've talked about a case today and the fact of this unfortunate incident was uh, when we, we did attend this, this, this nomination. Uh, and the fact was that amongst 105 local repair workers and crew members on board an Afromax named PD, three people had been reported dead, one injured and two missing. This is what it was as a fact and we got nominated with this piece of information. In fact, the 105 figure was not as clear and specific uh, as we can uh, imagine. They, they said over 100 were there, but that was later on uh, found out to be that. That is what the vessel ended up looking like, an Aframex tanker. You usually don't see the insides of cargo tanks as clearly opened up like this as a bulk area would be. These are the first two tanks which you see, but if you, can, if you look immediately under deck of the open structure, there are two more tanks which are forward of this opened up tank, which actually blew into these aft tanks. And as a result, the, the tank top, which looked like this throughout, was ripped up and blown up into the sky. I've got a video of it, which is freely available on YouTube. And I'll, I'll, I'll reduce the sound of it, but I'll keep it playing while we're talking about, about the matter. Let me reduce the volume of that so it doesn't disturb us, but you can keep watching that in the background. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the opinions that came out of this immediately as the media and they're still available, at least I know two out of these are still available. Uh, if you Google up the, the, uh, the incident, uh, but the ship had been emptied, it said of oil. That's a fact, which may have created more space for flammable gas to expand may have again when you write the word may is full of assumption so that's that's a clear indication of an assumption let's go to the next point we're not here to carry on uh, liberating about it but that's the key word there vessel was hit by three blasts erupting at the aft of the ship causing damage in the engine room well the engine room was never damaged number one the pump room was but the vessel was hit by three blasts. Come on. Clearly, blasts don't hit, blasts happen. So th there is, a, the moment you read it, you know that this is written by somebody who does not understand incidents and living quarters, another one. Living quarters, how many people talk about, you know, accommodation structure in the, on a vessel uh, or a superstructure, living quarters. Well, they may describe it, but again, a non nautical term. The sparks of the fire was the spark of the fire was caused by welding work, but the cause of several explosions remains unclear. Well, by reading this statement by press, and I'm, I've written this with the perspective of how important media mingle is in a incident and a big incident. So it's very important that. If there is something like this, that if, if you are representing uh, an owner or a charterer or an asset owner, it is important that you give out first the statement of fact for, for the media 
and not leave it to them to deliver, deliberate on it. It is believed that a potential cause of the explosion, there you go, you see the blast there. Uh, a potential cause of explosion was a residual flavor. It is believed, it is believed. Again, another, and these statements are full of assumptions and there's no factual uh, aspect of it. And let's come to the last one. The vessel certified as having been gas free was in ballast at the time of the casualty. Now, out of these four statements, the only one which is closest to fact is point number D. And it is so because we were on board when uh, we were investigating the very next morning after this happened at 5.30 in the evening. The vessel was indeed certified, but unfortunately the vessel was certified for the next four days after the blast had happened. So the vessel, the vessel had enough problems to take care of and the owners enough and the PNI club had enough on hands. The last thing you needed is people, and this was a national flag vessel, not a flag of convenience. So there was this vessel all over the national TV when they were talking about one of their national flag vessels was blown up like this. So there were all sorts of media speculation. So, so statement of fact going from the owners about the incident, very brief but truthful, has to be absolutely thought of immediately as the first thing. I think most people have, and that's why I've mentioned the media mingle. They're the best ones to mess up things. Uh, 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 a potential claim and defense. And this, this video is still there. Can you imagine? They've not been able to take them off still. Anyway, getting on. Our hottest topic this year, and this time last year, before uh, anybody knew about the sea of uh, Corona, there was a, a lot of talk about how very low sulfur fuel oil would create a large number of claims. And let's talk about one such incident and see how we can have a number of assumptions. And this is from a perspective of charters. Yeah. So let's see how we can have a bit of, um, a bit of um, fun with this particular case. Yeah. <clears throat> let's talk about the facts. Dispute between the vessel owner and charter about VLSFO, that is very low sulfur fuel oil supply and quantity is on an exponential rise due to engine room malfunction, breakdown, stoppages, diversion for overhauls. Now, when you get a nomination sometimes from your favorite charters or large charters, chartering houses to go out there and protect their interest. Now, as an independent surveyor, first of all, you have to make up your mind whether you want to put yourself out there as uh, owners or charters, pet representatives, very dangerous because uh, insurance clubs will immediately look at you as somebody who, who, who works with charters, sides them, protects them, etc. Et Much like criminal lawyers who always um, uh, uh, who always defend the guilty party or the criminal party. So they get a kind of a reputation saying that, let's go to Spencer Lawyer because he is very good at defending criminal cases or guilty parties. So you get a bit of that kind of a reputation. So as an independent, it's very important to think if you want to take up the nomination for an asset owner or a charter when they say, go out there and protect my interests. I may have supplied the sulfur, it may be, Spurious, it may be, but you've got to give me a report or kind of go there to, to tell me what is to be done to protect my interest. We do not do that as constellation, but there might be some people listening to us today who might be thinking about this aspect of it. However, let's get on with some of the, 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 the assumptions that may come up uh, in a case uh, of uh, a dispute like this. So. You would easily see the note of protest which flies from A to B. It might not be factual what is protested for. It needs to be investigated with evidence. Only then it becomes fact, but it might be the starting point of what, who is saying what, uh, the why bit we can, we can, we can look at later. We're 20 minutes into it, we're doing well. So let's see. 
Honors allege poor fuel quality supply. Of course, if you have engine room issues, if you got breakdown, malfunction, plungers, we, we, this particular case, we had plungers, uh, engine, uh, main engine and auxiliary engine, which had uh, simultaneously got uh, buggered up and there was a lot of sludging, the, the injectors were all jammed up, etc, etc. So, manifold samples were tested at a preferred lab, that's what they said. Because only after you test the supply samples would you start using that fuel. And the owners also have alleged saying that potentially pre-arranged samples were given to the vessel. Now, when pre-arranged samples are given to the vessel, we do a lot of fueling, uh, witnessing and claims in Fujaira. And what has been a, an early trend when LSFO started is that they have premeditated sample bottles. There's a bottle that's stuck and taking a drip, but at some stage, it gets swapped very conveniently and the premeditated sample is actually there if you're not keeping your eyeballs on the samples that are being taken at the ship's manifold, sometimes the barge manifold, mostly at the ship's manifold. So that, those, that's clean oil and it's nice and it's not mixed with any, any spikes, anything. But that's what the owners alleged, it happens. We are aware of it when we were, uh, we, we were questioned about what are they talking about and why is this? We said, yes, it, 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 is, it is a trend, at least in, in our part of the world. I do not know other feeling ups, but we did say uh, yes. Then <clears throat> charters alleged co-mingling of fuel from previous supplies, compatibly aspect. Now, if you get the samples tested and they're okay, the chief engineer starts using them. But when he starts using them, engine rooms have service tanks, settling tanks. And when service tanks and settling tanks have got the previous fuel and the, the new supply, which is alleged to be uh, questionable, gets mixed up, the quantity in the service and settling tank is enough to create a sludge if the two fuels are not compatible. And that's something to look for and to collect evidence for. And only if that commingled sample, which probably already is burnt and gone, is not recorded as to how the shift the sh flushing of the engine and the old fuel was before the old one, the new one was used, it is something that we can put in the report in such claims as a fact. Charter is alleged engine manufacturer's recommendation of fuel management was not followed by the ship's engineers. Now, when a charter makes such a claim, he has to have a clear hand on all the log books, all the procedures of changeover, ask questions to the engineers. It would be a very difficult one if a charter puts and alleges something like this that was not formed because if you are alleging something, the onus of proof of something as ambiguous as point number three would be on your shoulders. Tank, tank cleanliness and sludge management inadequate is another one. Again, another one difficult to prove because, you know, nobody enters into fuel tanks and doesn't understand fully unless you have uh, evidence that before you took it, took the new fuel, your the tank, nominated tank in which the supply was taken was absolutely clean and clear. So there's so many things that can be absolutely um, potentially ambiguous in a claim like this. Now, when a fuel claim like this comes and somebody, uh, an asset owner, ship owner says that my engines have got buggered up because of bad fuel, uh, our experience, we've done at least about 15 claims this year on this particular aspect itself. And I can tell you, our chief engineer, Ramesh, who's an ex-Bureau Veritas Surveyor, has always come out and, and had a difficult, whether it's for uh, underwriters, PNI clubs, charters, you know, uh, uh, charters, PNI, whatever it is, PND, it is extremely difficult as an owner or a position of an owner is extremely jeopardized uh, to be able to put a finger on a bad fuel quality unless he has all the aspects taken care of. So, moving on, let's talk about uh, uh, another. We'll go a little, little, little fast on this now. The grounding, grounding claims are fantastic. Uh, again, another aspect uh, of uh, the, the claims world, which is not visible to your, your eyes. So it, it has a potential of a lot of assumptions uh, and there have to be a lot of discrete findings. 
Ooh, I don't know what that was. Oh, sorry. Uh, a lot of discrete findings have to be uh, in place before you can get your uh, report together. So several discrete findings were built together to support an opinion which may become a fact, uh, which that becomes evident from the facts. And we will talk about some of the examples of this, um, this and how surveyor's role is important in this. Oh, my God. Sorry about that. How surveyor's role is important in an investigation, which is uh, MLS grounding. That's one of the jobs that we did. Uh, after she's pulled out of the water and after a diving report, it is very clear how much of a damage, but when you are investigating on the cause consideration, it is a difficult one to put together. <clears throat> so let's talk about some examples which point towards a particular conclusion when a uh, grounding incident there. Hmm? There are always soundings that you can take around the vessel, provided if she's still sitting there where the master alleges that she's grounded. Uh, and we can put together something like the port side showed that there was evidence of clear water. Uh, ship's log shows previous grounding of on the port side several months before. Therefore, it's unlikely that the damage occurred as a result of this grounding cannot be ruled out. What cannot be ruled out is it does not matter if the ship had grounded before on the port side and there was evidence that there was a reported uh, grounding, maybe on the same port, maybe another port, but the port side. And However, it can be possible that she's again grounded on the same side. It has aggravated the damage, etc. So it's a very complicated one if an incident happens, but you've got to have a lot of evidence based uh, uh, eyewitness based crew statements, a lot of things for grounding, but the, the, the fact remains is usually debatable. Uh, grounding claim, unless she's gone and sat there like this vessel has uh, on, on, a, on a hard beach or a hard um, coral, uh, this thing, and she's there, it's clear that she's grounded. There's absolute factual evidence. Moving on. <clears throat> There are some, there are some reasons that I've put together uh, why an opinion is not to be given. Cause, caution on providing these when asked for, opinion have to be based on facts available only. Let's say, if you had a crane operator that had failed a breath analyzer test immediately after a crane incident or a damage incident, uh, you could you could easily put down that it is your opinion that because he was intoxicated, he is not able to operate the crane in a safe manner. Well, it does not mean that it was the only reason. It could also mean at that time that the crane limit switch was bypassed, etc., etc. The wire parted because of it being weak, old, etc. But an opinion based on facts available only may be something that you, I just gave you a clean example, but point being that it, it could be based on a lot of facts, but opinions have to be given for causation because you've got to put some cause considerations when asked for in your report, especially an investigative report for uh, an incident. Opinions may differ when more for facts are disclosed or made available. This single statement written in and uh, written at the end of your cause consideration uh, is a very important escape that you may have if you are uh, questioned later on because not everything is available to uh, to you or shown to you or uh, um, you know kind of disclosed to you when you are going on board it's much like looking at this phone and saying there's something black at the other end of this phone and I'm looking at the screen, you're looking at this end, but I've only been shown the screen. So I'm looking at that on the phone, you're looking at that on the phone. So when you are looking at it and reporting, you're saying something blue, something black at the back stuck, and that's it. But when I'm looking at it, I'm reporting that, a nice shiny black screen. So what is shown to you, subsequently if it is turned, you might be able to see more information. So please add this one line and we do it as a practice, it's very, very important. However, <coughs> this is my 
second last slide and i must start telling you how important it is when you see the first few pictures or hear of the first nomination that it is a major calamity the new diamond which is uh, which blew up in um, near, in the indian ocean near the coast of sri lanka is now in pujara and kalba rather it's being discharged and uh, when you hear of these big incidents and you have a nomination or, or, or a first picture of it looks like this when it comes to you from anywhere, you know for a fact that there is definitely some aspect of your work might be going in front of lawyers and it may be litigious. So when a nomination like that comes, the first and foremost thing one must be very clear and do is limit the report to facts only <clears throat> that is the first and the most important i mean you might you might want to take up nomination of one party or the other but it never falls in the right uh, you, you will never fall when you jump off you will never fall on your feet you'll always wobble when a <laughs> question of those reports so stick to facts when it's litigious is the point if one feels information is of value but is outside the scope of work there are always telephones See clients advice, verbal reports, best, confidential notes, not mentioning report number, just send it to the client separately. It, it, is, it may not uh, add up to the report, but the clubs love confidential notes. Information should not become public knowledge. Now this in terms of uh, the, this, the, the cyber vulnerability aspect of, of, of the world that is this coming through, Unfortunately, we've done so many pen tests and it is something that is so easy these days, but if you are responsible for collecting evidence and information, and if that leaks through your sources, you'll be hung by your, your legs, I might say politely, if it is found out. Uh, on the onset, if, if you are being nominated by clubs, underwriters, etc., and there are lawyers kept in copy. It always makes sense to address all your uh, your 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 reports and your advisories to the legal advisors or to the lawyers uh, who are uh, in copy. This has to be sought out right up front by the correspondents or uh, y'all with the club as uh, or underwriters. That can we send it to your lawyers first because they have the right of disclosure and they might be able to hold back your report and is uh, before it gets out in the uh, in in a, in a in a court of law being debated because independent reports are admissible in courts of law and that is why it's important to have them uh, stuck to facts only let's get on with the last slide and i would like to summarize it i don't know what the last slide is doing there from i think but i'll put up all them together Let's start with saying, uh, do not take up litigious enough matters if you do not have reasonable experience. In that case, a container vessel coupling up, if you've not got experience on such vessels and such jobs, uh, anything and everything you write in that report and sign it off will be shredded into pieces by the opposition. Where the first thing they will question is the credibility of the person attending. So if you are not experienced enough, do not attend litigious jobs. You have to be extremely, extremely competent because any any this uh, debate on whether what you've written is right, wrong, factual or not will be questioned and will be taken apart by the other side if it's going against them because you would not have experience to do so. Uh, that, that, do a job like that. So do not take it up. Seek senior advice. Seek. Uh, get the right person in your team to do courses, courses is the first point. Do not give out an opinion easily, nor without being asked for. Sticking to facts is the safest business. We've survived, I've survived 17 years in UAE, uh, of which uh, 14 have been uh, as Constellation Marine, and I, I can tell you that it is always a safe way to do business if you write a factual report. There'll be less of fingers pointed. Uh, leaving the conclusion bit out for lawyers to draft is always a good idea. You report the facts and leave the conclusion bit. Let them ask for it. Uh, if you have to conclude it 
market for subtitle very clearly as saying it's a technical conclusion or it's a technical cause of consideration and not a legal one because there's a big difference in how a technical person uh, concludes a certain matter on causation, on why it happened, what happened, than a legal person would be. So please be very, very careful with that. Uh, I, would, I would just safely say that we, we've left a conclusion out. Uh, this is what we saw, this is what we found, this is the logbook, this is the photographs, this is the extent of damage, and leave it to that. Why and what happened, let them ask for it. We will answer them. There's nothing wrong in one extra email being exchanged on a big matter, especially if it's fictitious. Beware of the words, protect our members' interest as independent surveyors in your instruction note. Uh, seek clarity at once because uh, we, we I don't name anybody or say anything, but there is enough number of uh, correspondents, enough number of junior claims handlers who may think that protecting the owner's interest or the charter's interest is our job. It's not our job to protect anybody's interest. Uh, go back to them and ask them to please clarify what they mean. Because it is, if you sit with that instruction in your mailbox and you write a report thereafter and it's discovered that somebody nominated you to protect somebody's interest as an underwriter, it might be jeopardizing your independence and your integrity for what you have gone there for. Always and forever, look for exclusions in your report. I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book uh, for the IMS and always and forever look for exclusions in your report. Mention areas not seen or documents not given to you. Let's say, for example, if there was, a, let's take the example of very close sulfur fuel oil, which is there. Uh, if the if the ship owner and you go on there as a charters nomination uh, or charters PNI club nominations, you if you are not shown the ship's logbook or how the transfer of fuel took place and things like that, but it is uh, an important spoke of the wheel of your uh, process of finding coming down to the uh, to the to the bottom of the whole matter, and somebody has held back information. They're not showing you logbook entries, how they use, how they change over procedure of fuel oils. You might want to put that down clearly in your report, saying that I would have, I would want to look at how they, what the internal procedures are, what the company's systems are for change over one type of fuel over to another type, and they've not shown us no logbooks have been shown, but it forms a very important aspect of your uh, your fact collecting um, uh, mission. So with that, with a lot of exclusions written in your report, or at least a few of areas not seen, I would say that if this particular slide is, is pondered upon or chewed upon well, uh, with or without what I've said is live examples earlier, you would have probably looked at it, uh, this, this subject in a more comprehensive manner. Uh, I'm sticking to 40 minutes. That is my last slide. And I'd like to say that some of my examples are coming from the books that I've studied from. These are the three books that I've picked some examples and um, some fundamentals of and use those to, 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 to make my presentation with live cases that we've attended. Uh, um, and, um, uh, uh, and my heartfelt gratitude and those who are still wondering whether to take up the IIMS diploma or not, I would wholeheartedly endorse and recommend you all to do it. They become such gold mines in your library uh, that you cannot imagine. And presentations like these take me back into my books and notes. And I always come back with nuggets. And I'm thankful to Mike and the IIMS headquarters team to give me the opportunity to do so. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very, very much for listening. I'm open to questions or suggestions or anything else that you'll have to say. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Zareya. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you for the, the plug on the IMS diploma. Uh, we've had a record number of students actually join us this year. I don't know if that's COVID related, but uh, we've got currently over 200 people now uh, studying the diploma. Um, a couple of things I would pick up on and just endorse that you said really. Uh, one is this whole thing about working outside your area of competence. That's not directly related to the report, 
But of course, when you come to put your report together, it becomes obvious to the reader of the report that you know you, you, you don't quite know exactly what you're dealing with. And that links, I suppose, into the other issue or the other matter I wanted to stress, which is um, you are potentially writing every report for a judge and jury three, four, five years down the line. And uh, again, I would just agree entirely with Zaria, if you've got some uh, content in your report that is not factual, uh, is an opinion and can't be substantiated by facts, then a judge and jury and particularly a, a boisterous barrister on the other side is going to have a bit of a field day. And uh, we see that. We see that. And uh, Zaria, I'm sure you've seen it too. And you know, the, the, I think those for me are the two key takeaways. Um, so stick to the facts and um, certainly in the small craft arena, less so in the commercial ship arena, but I would say almost all the complaints I get, and I get maybe 20 to 25 complaints here, they're all about small craft surveyors, rarely do I get one about a commercial ship surveyor, but it just goes to highlight the point. Um, I would say probably in 90% of the cases, it's not a lack of technical competency or capability that's let the surveyor down, it's the report. And it might just be one aspect and we, we saw something crazy really, but we saw somebody who put a comma in the wrong place in a sentence and it completely changed the meaning of the sentence. And uh, when it came to court, it cost him £8,000 uh, simply because he put a comma in the wrong place. And uh, it's hard, isn't it? You know, because we're not all um, linguists, we're not all English you know, grammar students. I don't know if you'd agree with all of that, Sarah, but that'd be my take on it. I completely agree with you, Mike. Uh, and uh, one aspect of it is, uh, is English, uh, which is absolutely so important to write well in good English and clear English. Uh, but uh, I think days are gone now that, that people pick on uh, small uh, grammar, etc., etc. At least not in uh, in 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 um, in our part of the world, because uh, and and you know reports come from all over the place, uh, and and some are good, some are uh, not so good in their narrative. It, it is an important aspect, but you know picking and uh, nitpicking on that aspect, I think. Fewer and fewer are doing, but it is still uh, important because it gives that uh, that that last finishing brush to to the report. Uh, however, <coughs> um, uh, to pan out on a, a factual report versus a, a, a report that has um, a lot of assumptions or tendency of an assumption to put in the the, the thumb rule that we use in our organization is, is the, the KISS fundamental. Keep it short and simple. So keeping it short and simple, the KISS fundamental, always helps. So if you ask me a factual report versus a report full of assumption, the factual report will always be to the point, will be a short one, will be crisp. There will be no ifs, buts, and maybes, and things like that. And um, uh, and the first thing when you look at a 20 page, 25 page narrative report is saying, oh, this is just about some oil spilled in the water. Why is it 20 pages? And when it goes into that versus a five, seven page factual report on quantities and what got stained and how much, and you would know immediately that there is something that you can pick on. So in other words, the more you write, the more tendency of you making assumptions. That's the point I'm making. I agree entirely, sorry. And in actual fact, I, I saw a small craft surveyor's report the other day that was over 100 pages. I, I can't imagine who on earth um, is going to uh, read 100 pages. They won't. They'll go to the presumably executive summary um, and just read that bit. You know, people are busy people. Uh, so I think generally reports are too long. I, I've just had a comment coming from Greg, which I want to relay into you. So, Greg says he finds it valuable to have his report proofread by someone other than himself in order to uh, make sure it is understandable, grammatically correct, and reads well. And again, I mean, uh, proofreading is a whole different skill set. 
Um, so again, if it's not something that you're good at, I agree, Greg, and I'm sure Zuri will too, get someone else who can just put a fresh set of eyes over it. Uh, the one piece of free software I would um, happily promote to anybody is Grammarly. Um, so I always have Grammarly open on my machine. When I type something incorrect, Grammarly tells me I've done something wrong. So it's not just spelling. It looks at the grammar. If it doesn't like the look of it, then it tells me and gets me just to think about have I said the right thing. So, um, yeah, really good advice. Anything to say on proofreading, Zaria? Yeah, indeed. We have a system of guardian angel in our uh, in our company. So there's never a lone soldier in the field. He's <laughs> always from the time the nomination uh, starts, uh, they have the free will to to choose their guardian out of the team of 20 that we have. And uh, uh, obviously they go to the most compatible friend that they have, but the guardian angel has a responsibility saying, no, I don't know much about this. I'm a cargo surveyor and I'm not a fuel oil su surveyor. Or I'm not um, um, having sailing experience. So I can't guide you on a lashing calculation on a, on a yacht that is being transported on the back of a ship. So, so, <clears throat> Guardian angels are great because they have the sense in our uh, company of, of, of a panned out version and they always look at the job with the perspective of a client. So they wear a client's hat, they read the report saying, what would this report sound like to a, a, a PNI club claims and law or lawyer? So they always give you a perspective on it. Of course, proofreading comes with that. Proofreading is absolutely key. You know, it, 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 when we were in 2007, we didn't have the luxury of anyone proofreading. My dear wife used to, and she used to read it from a lay person's perspective. And she used to be absolutely critical about it. Say, I don't understand what you've written. And that was my first cue, because if she doesn't understand it, neither would a claims handler sitting across the seas would, or a, or a charter or a ship owner. So having it proofread by a non-technical person, whether they understand the flow of the story or ask you questions that how it is and why is it, why have you written that is a very, very important uh, solution to the, to the, to the problem. It, it, if you have finished a report in the night, you can get your head down, get up in the morning before you click send and tell yourself you're reading this as the client. I mean, self reading as well, but with the mindset of a bit of a break and a bit of a changed perspective to read it yourself also helps. That's that's the only thing I'd say about proofreading was absolutely critical about uh, uh, proofreading a report. Uh, you can tell when a report is not proofread or mail that are not, not proofread. When you read your own mail after some time that you missed out a few things, you know it is it is a shoddy job. It just completely discredits the the fact what you've written in the report. And it's not just reports oh. as well, actually, Saria, because I, I looked at a surveyor's website, and I won't mention his name the other day. I went to his website, his homepage contained four spelling mistakes. And I immediately thought if I was a client looking for a surveyor, and I went to the first page of his website, and it was full of problems and issues, I, how could I potentially engage the guy? Uh, because if that's the quality of his um, work and his proofing, then what, what quality the uh, report? Silly, isn't it, really? Crazy. S simple little things. Yeah. Okay, Zaria, fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, great.